possesses the accumulation of material possessions or the attainment of a position of power or prestige or something of that sort. I think those are worthy accomplishments and very, very well may be indicative of success, but not necessarily so in my opinion. So I wanted to work on something else. And in 1934, I, I coined my own definition of success. I choose to define success as peace of mind, which can be attained only through self-satisfaction in knowing you made the effort to become the best of which you're capable. That's success. Our capabilities are not the same but we should all be able to make the same effort, the best effort to our abilities under the conditions that exist for us. We should make the effort to try to improve those conditions. We may not be able to improve to the extent that others, but that's worrying about things over which we have no control. I'd rather think my idea uh, of success came from my father. I think, I know he tried to get across to myself and my brothers. Uh, we were raised on a small farm and southern Indiana before we lost it in the Depression. And, and, and Dad, I, I didn't appreciate it at the time, didn't understand it at the time, but something did sink in because I remembered it some time later. I got the idea, not so many words. But his idea was never trying to be better than someone else, but never ceased to try to be the very best that you could be. That's something that's under, under your control. The other person's ability isn't under your control, but yours should be under your control. And I think perhaps I got it from him. He, 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 he believed in that, and, 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 and I know in his way, he was trying to get it across to him. And I think perhaps it did sink in, but I'm realizing it, it came out when I tried to, to <clears throat> coin my own definition of success. But after a while, I'm not satisfied. Uh, something's lacking. I studied a while, tried to, tried to analyze it, and I finally decided that this was only a definition something rather abject, something you can't see. And I believe that things we see are a little more meaningful, perhaps, uh, than things about which we only hear. So I wanted to come up with something you could see. And in the hidden recesses of the mind, something popped out that I, too, had, had seen many years before called a ladder of achievement. Someone had taken a ladder with five runs in the ladder, and they'd named each rung some personal trait or characteristic that this particular individual felt was necessary if you wanted to get to the top of the ladder. And I know we all want to get to the top of the ladder, even though we might disagree on what the top of the ladder is. So I couldn't use a ladder, obviously, but from that I got the idea of a pyramid. And I started working on this in 1934 and completed it in 1948 when I was in Indiana State University just prior to coming to UCLA. I placed success, according to my definition, at the apex. I started working from the bottom up. The foundation must be strong. If any structure is to have real strength and solidity, of course it must have a strong foundation. And the cornerstones anchor the foundation. And in 1934, I selected the two blocks that are the cornerstones that I never changed. I had many different ideas as the, the years passed by, and I gave it more and more thought. But never did I change the cornerstones. I dropped some ideas. I replaced them with others. I'd probably change it if I some things if I started over again, but not the cornerstones. I changed the position within the structure. I put different ideas in until I came as it is now, and I haven't changed it since 1948. One cornerstone is industriousness, and the other one is enthusiasm. You have to work hard, you have to enjoy what you're doing, you have to be enthusiastic about it. Industriousness, there is no substitute for work. Too many people look for the shortcut, they look for the easy way, they look for the trick to accomplish things, and you may get by with such methods for a while, but they're not lasting, and you'll not be developing the strengths that you have by doing that. Grandin Rice, I consider to be the greatest sports writer of all time. He wrote many things in verse to illustrate points. And, and he wrote something called How to Be a Champion and said, you wonder how they do it, and you look to see the knack. You watch the foot in action, or the shoulder, or the back. But when you spot the answer, or the higher glamour's lurk, you'll find it moving higher up the laurel-covered spire that the most of it is practice, and the rest of it is work. 
There's another verse or two that say essentially the same thing. There is no substitute for work. The other cornerstone is enthusiasm. You have to like what you do. You have to love what you do. If you're going to make the most of what you have, you may be tremendously talented, but if you don't really enjoy it, you're not, not, not going to become a, as good and as accomplished of, as you're capable of. You'll never reach your own particular level of competency unless you're enthusiastic about what you're doing. This is a people-oriented world. We're working with people in every area in one way or another, not just in the home or in the community, but in every way. We are in one way or another. And, and, and if we want to stimulate those with whom we're associated, we must be enthusiastic. Otherwise, it, it, it just will not make the most of our abilities. I think of my first year at UCLA, when I think of enthusiasm, I attended a meeting one evening to hear a gentleman speak on a topic in which I had absolutely no, absolutely no interest. You might say, where'd you go? My first year at UCLA, we had one of these championships or anything, and someone under whose supervision I was indicated it'd be nice if I was there. Didn't say it had to be, but I got the point. And I was there, sat close to the front, hoped they'd note my presence. Uh, I wanted to establish my first year and everything, and I'd seen, already seen uh, basketball candidates, and I knew it was kind of sorry. So I better establish myself in other ways because I don't think this material's going to do it. But uh, before long, my attitude had changed, and I found myself listening intently to everything he had to say, and was sorry when he brought his remarks to a close. Primarily, I feel for two reasons. He knew his subject, he knew what he's talking about, and that kind of helped. But he also was enthusiastic, and he was not enthusiastic in a loud or bombastic sort of way, but it radiated in his countenance, there was a sparkle in his eye. He loved his subject, and he knew it. A few days later, I'd been over the UCLA administration building, and upon my return to my office, I came by Powell Library, and with no intention whatsoever, honestly, of going into the library, I did go into the library, and just sort of found myself browsing around in the stack, seeking additional information in regard to a topic about which only a few days before I had absolutely no interest at all, none at all. A topic that has given me a lot of satisfaction in the last 40 years. And without the enthusiasm of this one particular individual, that wouldn't have happened, I'm sure. Enthusiasm brushes off on those with whom you come in contact. Between the cornerstones of the structure, forming the foundation, I have three blocks that I think are strong. I consider them strong because each block includes others. And we may include others, we're adding strength. Friendship, loyalty, and cooperation. Friendship you must work at. Too often we don't work at it. We take it for granted. We think it's friendship when someone's doing nice things for us. It's nice, it's a nice person, but that isn't friendship. It's friendship when you do for each other. You have to work at it just as you must work at marriage. If a marriage is going to be successful, it's a question of giving. And both sides, both sides, otherwise it will not be successful. So, uh, it's, we must have friends. If I was speaking in San Francisco, a few years ago at an IBM convention, and following my remarks, a gentleman came up to me and he said, Johnny, this was a classmate of mine, I should say, from Purdue. They always lived in Indianapolis all his life, and he came up to me afterwards and said, Johnny, people in California certainly aren't as friendly as they are back home, aren't they? And I said, well, what do you mean, Bob? He said, coming over this morning, met a lot of people, not a single person spoke to. He said, it never happened back in Indianapolis. I said, you speak to any of them? He said, I didn't know any. <laughs> well, there's a pretty good point there, I think. We wait for the other person to speak. Certainly no one is going to speak. You must work at friendship. No, 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 I never take it for granted. Loyalty. Loyalty. How can you make the most abilities you have unless you have someone to whom you must be loyal and someone who, with whom you must share? <coughs> I don't think it's possible unless you have others to whom loyalty must be shown and, 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 and with whom you share. And then you must have something as well as someone to which you must be loyal. Whether it's the employer or whoever it might be, you must have some, something to which you must be loyal. Loyalty belongs to the foundation of the structure if you're going to reach success according to my particular definition. The other cornerstones of cooperation, small world in which we live. Modern science and technology, of course, makes it smaller and smaller all the time, and it will continue to happen. We see things now that are happening on the other side of the world as they're happening. 
we see someone land on the moon, I think. The amazing things that have been done in outer space and whatnot through modern science and technology. The rapid means of transportation that get us from one spot to another. Oh, we need others so much. Is there anything, is there anything that you consider to be essential in your personal life or in your professional life for which others are not responsible? Could it be the food you eat or the clothes you wear or the means of transportation that get you from one spot to another or the homes in which you live or the buildings where you conduct your profession the schools such as this and others, others involved and if we're cooperative we will receive cooperation. So those are the blocks that make up the foundation of the structure. The second tier, I have four blocks. One is self-control, the second is alertness, the third is initiative, and the fourth is intentness. You must maintain self-control to function near your level of competency. If you lose your self-control, you can't perform physical acts or make mental decisions that are what you're capable of doing. Because emotion is taking over, and when emotion takes over, as a general rule, reason slips away. So you must keep them under control. Physically, for example, I suspect among this group here we have uh, many that play golf, or at least think you do, or try to. <laughs> but I, I, I dare say that, uh, that on the golf course, if you lose your self-control, I know where you're going to be after each drive most of the time. It won't be where you want to be. It'll be off the side somewhere where you'll be searching for your ball in all probability. Of course, I'm not going to be most of me anyway, but if you've lost your self-control, I know it's going to be there. You must maintain self-control in performing any physical act. Suppose it's this discipline, your children at home, and our children cry out for discipline. Yet, as long as it's discipline, and if you remember why you discipline, not to punish, but to help, to prevent, to correct, to improve, if you do it with that in mind, I think you'll have a great chance of getting desirable, positive results. If you antagonize, it's going to be far more difficult to get productive, desirable results. I don't think you can antagonize and positively influence very well at the same time. So we must keep our emotions under control, whether it be performing a physical act or making a mental decision. Alertness is the second topic. And in the second block, in the second tier, alertness. There's something going on around about you all the time from which we can all learn. But too often we don't see it because we get lost in our own narrow tunnel vision. We're all selfish to a degree. It's natural. We all have egos. But we can get so much so that we don't see the wonderful things all around about us all the time. Uh, and, 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 and we must see. We must be alert and alive. There's something can help us around us all the time. My favorite American is Abraham Lincoln, this great and gentle human being, had the unique and wonderful ability to say so much in just a few words. I think his immortal Gettysburg Address of some 268 words is far more meaningful than many volumes. But his simple statements, such as, there's nothing stronger than gentleness. Most anyone could stand adversity, but to test a person's character, give them power. He said, the worst thing you can do for those you love are the things they could and should do for themselves. He said when being criticized by some northerners near the end of the terrible war between the states, that he was supposed to destroy his enemies, not make friends of them. And he said, am I not destroying an enemy when I make a friend of them? Yes, he had a wonderful ability to say much in, in just a few words. You must be alert. He said, I never met a person from whom I did not learn something. Although most of the time it was something not to do. Well, that's being alert. You can learn what to do and what not to do. Oftentimes, if you're just alert, if you're not, you're going to miss out. The next uh, block is initiative. Act. Act when action is needed. Don't be afraid. Never wanted a player to take a shot if he thought he was going to miss. Of course, I had some that I thought was going to miss, but uh, <laughs> I wish they had the shot. <laughs> you must have initiative. You must not be afraid to act. The greatest failure of all is failing to act when action is needed. You must act uh, with self-control, 
you must have reason, you must act uh, according to the information that you've acquired, you experienced the past in regard to the particular situation that requires action, but act. Don't be afraid to fail, because you are not perfect, and you are going to fail at times. But don't let continued failure the same way, don't, don't be a failure the same way all the time. Learn from the failures and mistakes that you might make, and don't repeat them over and over. The last block in the second tier is intentness, that's determination, that's persistence, that's perseverance. You have to set goals, you have to be, you have to really persevere, persist to reach the goals. I think the goals should be uh, realistic. I think there's a tendency on occasions to make goals so idealistic that they're unattainable, and sooner or later those become self-evident, and when they do, they'll become counterproductive. So the goal should be difficult to achieve because things easily acquired or achieved aren't very meaningful and don't amount to much. They should be difficult, but within the realm of, realm of possibility, you don't let obstacles and adversity deter you from a continuation of your course. It may make you change it. It may make you, make you back up and look over and, and start over. It may make you go around or under, but you don't quit. You're persistent and determined. You get stronger through adversity. When I look back, it seems to be all the grief that had to be left me when the pain was over, stronger than I was before. We get stronger physically through adversity, through weights. We get stronger mentally through adversity, through increasingly difficult problems, whether it be in mathematics, such as arithmetic, to algebra, to geometry, and so on. We need adversity to make us stronger. Rather than fear it, we should welcome it and know that it's going to make us a stronger and better person, whether it be physical, mental, or spiritual. We get stronger through adversity. So those are the four blocks in the uh, second tier. Now we move up to three blocks. We keep moving up one less block, of course. And I've had many people say, those just pertain to athletics. And I say, you're wrong. They certainly do pertain to athletics, but they pertain to other things as well. Condition is one, skill is the second, and team spirit is the third, which is nothing more than consideration for others. And we certainly need that, not just in athletics, we need it outside of athletics even more than we need it in athletics. But could you have to be conditioned for what you're doing, and it isn't just physical condition, you cannot attain and maintain desirable physical condition unless you're mentally and morally conditioned, and that's something that's within your power, if you so desire to have it, <coughs> it is within your power. You mustn't blame others. You can do it if you, if you have the discipline, the willpower, and really want to do it. There's different kinds of conditioning. Linebackers are not conditioned the same way that offensive linemen are. Uh, as they're not conditioned the same as wide receivers are. Doctors are not conditioned the same as attorneys are. Attorneys are not conditioned the same as nurses are. There's a different type of conditioning for almost everything. You must be conditioned for what you're doing. Whatever that might be, it be conditioned for. The, in, the, the center block is skill. You have to have a knowledge of and the ability to not only properly, but quickly execute. If you can't ex execute quickly, you may not get to execute at all. I think I perhaps said a little earlier that I've had some players that, that uh, were great shooters. My goodness, they could really shoot. But they weren't quick and couldn't get any shots. It doesn't help much. And then I had others could get all sorts of shots. They were really quick, couldn't shoot. But they could get them, and that didn't help us either. So you have to be able not only to do things properly, but quickly. Whether you're a surgeon, uh, faced with an emergency, you can't react quickly, you may lose the patient. An attorney may lose the case. You can lose your life. Many things can happen unless you can react quickly. So it is enough to know how. It is enough to know how to execute it properly, but you must also be able to execute it uh, quickly. No, no substitute for knowing your stuff and being able to execute it on front of quickly. The third block is team spirit, which is nothing more than consideration for others. I once heard it defined as a, a, a willingness to lose oneself in the group for the good of the group. And I used that for a while, but as after such and such a time, I, I wasn't happy with it. There was, it was missing something, and I, I, I couldn't determine exactly what it was until eventually I decided it was just one word. And it was the word willingness. If you're willing to do something you don't want to, probably, you're doing it because somebody asked you to or it's the thing to do. 
and you can't do your best at anything if you're just willing to do it. So I changed the definition and substituted the word eagerness for willingness. So it, 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 team spirit is, is, is an eagerness to lose oneself in the group for the good of the group. Then you have what we're looking for. We must have team spirit. I'm convinced that in this troubled world of ours today, if heads of state, people in such positions, had more consideration for others, our problems would not be as severe. I'm not naive enough to say that we'd have no problems. Of course, we'd have problems, always have problems. But problems would be much less severe if more, we were more considered of others. I think it's a terrible, terrible thing that in the history of our civilization, many wars have been fought, millions of lives have been lost, purely and simply because heads of state differed with others in regard to religion or race. And that's true. And if you and I individually don't try to do something each and every day of our lives to alleviate unjust prejudices, then we remain a part of the problem. Yes, we, 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 we must have consideration for others if we ever hope to come close to the potential that lies within us. I'd like to share something with you that occurred to me. Uh, that was helpful to me in the, in the mid-60s when we were having the uh, problems in regard to the Vietnam situation. And I found myself extremely critical, extremely critical of young men who were running off to Canada or the Scandinavian countries or somewhere to avoid the draft. I wouldn't want one of my loved ones to run away. I would hope they wouldn't have to go. Not, not just that war or any war, but I wouldn't want them to run away. But I found myself extremely critical of those who were running away, and that could have become cancerous within me, as envy becomes, as greed becomes, as jealousy becomes. It, it hurts you, it doesn't hurt others. It hurts you. And perhaps this was happening to me without my realization in regard to my feeling toward others who were doing this. And I was flying across country and picked up a magazine on a plane and picked up something that I had never seen before, written, written again by a sports writer who wrote many things in verse, which I like. That's the thesis of poetry. I dabble in it, enjoy it. And he wrote something that I hadn't seen. Grandpa Rice, something called Two Sides of War. He was, had been in the infantry in World War I. He'd been at the, at the front in France and, in, and observed the horrors of war at the very front. And there was tremendous shelling back and forth from the Allied lines and the German lines. And after one terrible shelling battle, where many were killed and maimed, he sat down behind the lines when there's a lull and wrote something that he called Two Sides of War. And he said, all wars are planned by older men. The council rooms apart. They call for greater armament and map the battle chart. But out upon the shattered fields where golden hopes are gray, how very young the faces are where all the dead men lay. Poorly and solemn in their pride, the elders cast their vote for this or that or something else that sounds the warlike note. But where their sightless eyes stare out, and gone are all their joys, I've nearly noticed nearly all the dead were hardly more than boys. The average age of our fatalities in the teens. Older people, of course, send them to, that, to their deaths. That didn't make me change my feeling about not wanting my own loved ones to run away, but it did make me less critical of those who might be. I got help. I got help when it was needed without my realizing it in a strange way. I'm glad I made that trip. Very glad. Just above those three blocks, two blocks, one is poise and one is confidence. Poise is much like self-control, and confidence is much like initiative, because they could be left out and replaced. There are many things that could replace them, but I've chosen not to. They're similar, but not identical. I also coined my own definition for poise. If you already got the idea, I like to do that. It's a very simple thing. Poise is just being yourself. It's just yourself. When you have poise, you're not acting. You're not pretending. You're not trying to be something you're not. You are yourself. And you will function near your own ability level, whatever that might be. And you must have confidence that you can do that. And it's possible to have poise and confidence, I believe, difficult. Of course, it's difficult, good things are, should be. 
How then can you acquire poise and confidence that's real, that's not whistling in the dark? By being industrious, by being enthusiastic, by being friendly, loyal, and cooperative, by maintaining your self-control, by being alert and alive and observing the things that are going on around about you, and not getting lost in your own narrow tunnel, vision and selfish ways, by having initiative and never fearing failure, but learning from failures of sense or when we things didn't turn out the way we want, learning from them not making the same ones over and over, and being intent and determined, and, and being persistent, and to persevere against all sorts of problems. To be conditioned for whatever you're doing. To have the skills to work, to acquire, to be able to, to execute, not only properly, but quickly, and being imbued with consideration for others, poise and confidence. It'll be real, it won't be false. The last block is competitive greatness. Loving it when it's difficult. That's, that's truly fun to being involved in a difficult situation. There's no great fun or enjoyment, in my opinion, to be derived from doing something that anybody else could do. And yet most of the things that each and every one of us have to do every day are simple tasks that most everyone could do. And whatever we're doing, we should try to do it to the best of our ability. But you won't get the pleasure and joy out of the simple tasks that you'll get out of being just involved in the more difficult I got far greater pleasure out of championships that we won when Al Cinder wasn't playing for me than I did when he was. I expected to win with him, although I know sometimes it's more difficult to do the expected than it is the unexpected. It still isn't going to give you the same same pleasure or satisfaction that you get out of, a, of doing the unexpected. The competitor, the real competitor, likes that. Brandon Rice wrote a great competitor, and he said, beyond the winning and the goal, Beyond the glory and the fame, he feels the flame within his soul, born of the spirit of the game. And where the barriers may wait, built up by the opposing gods, he finds a thrill in bucking fate and riding down the endless odds. Where others wither in the fire or fall below some raw mishap, where others lag behind or tire and break beneath the handicap, he finds a new and deeper thrill to take him on the uphill spin, because the test is greater still than something he can better. The great competitor revels in it when it's going to be the difficult challenge. That's fun. That's real fun. It's fun in 64 when the, the Dick Vitals and the Alan McGuire and the Billy Packers had us rated as the 77th best team in the nation and we went through undefeated and won the championship. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the things that give you passion and so on. From the last block, competitive greatness, leading up to the apex. One side, you'll notice faith, and on the other side, patience. We must have patience. Good things take time, and we must have faith that things are going to work out as they should. I didn't say the way we'd want them to, because they sh things shouldn't always work out the way you want them to. Sometimes that up, well, it's just better, you know. Nothing wrong with that. But there is something wrong when you don't make the effort to the best, to be the best that you can. Those are the things that I came up with in the period of uh, baseball, a Major League Baseball umpire some years ago by the name of George Moriarty. Made this sort of a little takeoff of this. Uh, Moriarty was kind of odd too. He was a Major League Baseball umpire, and yet he spelled Moriarty with only one I. And you'd be very surprised at how many Major League Baseball players noted that fact. <laughs> even, even so, they felt that he had more in his name at times than he had in his head. <laughs> he wrote something called The Road Ahead or The Road Behind and said, Sometimes I think the fates must grin. As we denounce them and insist, the only reason we can't win is the fates themselves have missed. Yet there lives on the ancient plain, we win or lose within ourselves. The shining trophies on our shelves can never win tomorrow's game. Yet you and I know deeper down there's always a chance to win the crown. But when we fail to give our best, we simply haven't met the test of giving all and saving none until the game is really won. Of showing what is meant by grit, of fighting on when others quit, of playing through, not letting up. It's bearing down that wins the cup. Of dreaming there's a goal ahead, of hoping when our dreams are dead, of praying when our hopes have fled. Yet losing, not afraid to fall, 
if gamely we have given all, for who can ask more of a man than giving all within his span? Giving all, it seems to me, is not so far from victory. And so the fates are seldom wrong, no matter how they twist and wind, it's you and I who make our fates. We open up or close the gates on the road ahead and the road behind. So true. As long as we don't blame others, we accept our responsibilities. As long as we make the effort to do the best that we can do under the conditions that exist for us and attempt to improve those conditions in honorable ways, there's no such thing as failure. I will close my remarks to you now. I suspect you're wondering why I went this long. Another poem, part of another poem. I'll just get your part of this. That has been meaningful to me, very meaningful. And I used it at various times in certain parts for players under my supervision, as I did many. But this one is called God's Hall of Fame. I don't know if any of them have ever heard of it or not. There's one part that says, this crowd on earth, they soon forget the heroes of the past. They cheer like mad until you fall. And that's how long you last. And that's so true in athletics. It's so true. They cheer you mad when you're doing well, but they're looking for somebody else when you don't do so well. That's human nature. We shouldn't complain. But God, he never does forget. And in his hall of fame, by just believing in his son, inscribed, you will find your name. I tell you, friends, I would not trade my name, however small, inscribed up there beyond the stars in that celestial hall. For any famous name on earth or glory that they share, I'd rather be an unknown here and have my name up there. I think we all would. And thank you for listening to your remarks. Thank you for coming to the camp. I wish you a safe journey home. Be with your loved ones again. And uh, hope to see you all again. Probably not at a basketball camp. But I'd like to see you all again. You know when it's right, you know when you feel it, baby. You hold it, you hear it, you taste it, it's right. You got the right one, baby. Yeah. If this irresistibly simple, uncontestably tasteable, and intimately wonderful, you got the right one, baby. Intimately soulful, you got the right one, baby. Uh -huh. With 100% The game may have been invented in Massachusetts, but Indiana is basketball's hometown. Round my Indiana homestead as they sang in years gone by. Now the basketballs are flying and they almost hide the sky. For where candle lights are gleaming from the sycamores afar, every son of Indiana shoots his basket like a star. Grandlin Rice's words are as true today as they were in 1910, when on an Indiana farm, John Robert Wooden was born. His parents filled his mind with a love of learning and hard work, and Indiana filled his heart with the love of a sport.
I suspect it would be almost impossible for people who did not grow up in Indiana to realize uh, how crazy really people are about basketball. The little town in which I lived was 4,800 at that particular time, and they built the new gymnasium that seated 5,200, and it was always full. If a girl was dating a local basketball player and they went to the movie on a Wednesday night, about 9 o'clock, the, the usher would come down with the fly slide and say, get on home, get your rest, because we have a big game this Friday. And, and the whole town was depending on it. In this world, farm boys could become heroes. And by captaining Martinsville High to the top, Johnny Wooden became a Hoosier legend. He went on to set Big Ten scoring records at Purdue and was named All-America three years running. In Massachusetts, they put him in the Hall of Fame. But back home, it was said, he was the king, the idol of every kid who had a basketball. In Indiana, that was every kid. Four decades later, the schoolboy hero had grown into the consummate coach. At UCLA, they called him the Wizard of Westwood. Yet the only magic he ever used were fundamentals, teamwork, and conditioning. And from this simple stock, he conjured up the NCAA's most successful program ever and became the only person ever inducted into the Hall of Fame as both a player and a coach. No team had ever won more than three NCAA titles. UCLA won 10 in 12 years. No team had ever won more than two titles in a row. UCLA won seven straight. But the most amazing thing of all is that winning was never the coach's standard of success. If Coach Wooden had never won a championship, he would be satisfied today with uh, himself. And here's the reason why. Because his definition, definition for success is peace of mind, which is a direct result of the self-satisfaction in knowing that you did your best to become the best you are capable of becoming. And I think that's a direct result, although I didn't realize it at the time, of my father trying to get across to me and my brothers that you should never try to be better than someone else. And he made it clear, but you should never cease to try to be the best that you can be, whatever you're doing. Wooden built his father's advice into the famed pyramid of success, which guided his career. But before entering the battle of the hardwood, Wooden won the battle of the heart. In my first year in high school, I met Nellie. I don't know how to explain it, but it just seemed like from the very beginning that uh, very shortly uh, we fell in love. Uh, she's the only girl I ever went with, and we had 53 uh, wonderful years of marriage together before I lost her about six years ago. I'd say 60 years of sweethearts and 53 is marriage, and that's the most important thing in, in my life. She had the greatest influence. The coach's trademark became a superstitious ritual, ending with the OK sign to Nellie, a tradition from their high school days in Martinsville that helped keep basketball in perspective. Family's always first. It shouldn't be. The Lord should be first. But I think, uh, I think if you truly uh, put your family first, I think he'll understand. Things went in the order of Nell, and his kids, and then basketball. And he was maybe fifth. I mean, he didn't, I mean, we're talking about a very selfless man. We always knew how important his family was to him, his uh, son and daughter and their kids. A lot of love and support, and it was obvious to us that family unit really supported him, and that was all the approval he really needed. Never was their support more needed than in 1948, when the coach left the fertile fields of Indiana for the basketball wasteland of Los Angeles. When I selected the squad, I thought, oh my, my Indiana State team would have just trounced them. We practiced on a third floor of an old gym, gymnastics practicing along the side, and, and they come up there in leotards, hopping around on those trampolines. My, my players noticed that. Of course, I didn't, but my players did. Whatever their motivation, Wooden's early UCLA teams were surprising winners, jazzing up West Coast basketball with their fast-breaking Indiana style. Bruins games became Westwood's most entertaining attraction. It was in practice, though, where Wooden's work was done. For he was teaching, not just coaching, and sought conditioning that was philosophical as well as physical. I can't say how many times I've heard over and over in my mind his catchy little phrases where he says so much with so few words. Be quick. But, but don't, don't hurry. hurry. I don't want activity without achievement. 
balance, mental, physical, emotional. Much can be accomplished if you're not worried about who's going to get the credit. I really don't remember the X's and O's of basketball. What he tried to do was to build people who would be winners who could react to circumstances in a way where their chances to succeed were improved. And the greater the pressure, the more likelihood to generate grace in the face of it. And then the ultimate thrust, of course, was the team, always has been the team here. And when the components came together, the success was pretty stunning. Wooden cultivated his quintessential team in 1964. No players stood over 6'5", but they made headlines with quickness and disciplined play and achieved grace with zone pressure during a perfect 30-0 season that gave the coach his first NCAA championship. Oh, brother! Look at the final. Here's a jumper. Oh, good, that's good! From 10 feet. Oh, and finally, Duke. And Duke finds the better play it out. Now, here come the Bruins. Led by Walt Hazard. Carry the trophy, emblematic of having won the NCAA I'd be among the millions that are congratulating you on one of the finest coaching jobs I ever saw. Thank you, Bill. I certainly appreciate it. Right. Mrs. Wooden, you've got to be very proud of this guy. I am. I'm, uh, I'm very proud you. of him and his wonderful team. Right. No single star could outshine the team, and the UCLA basketball family thrived. Wooden. Then Wooden announced the arrival of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and many wondered if the unity could survive. But Wooden knew this unique athlete wanted to help raise the team concept to new heights. And by refusing to lower his standards for him, the country coach kept his streetwise superstar in step with the team. I remember one time I got a lot of real good grades. And I, you know, I was kind of a little puffed up with myself and some mention was made of it. And I was like waiting for some praise. And, and, and his thing was that that is why you came here to get an education, right? And I, yeah, well, you know, and so we don't talk about that. Though one towered over the other, the coach and Kareem saw eye to eye from the start. Simply two giants of the game who enjoyed three championships in their three years together. After Kareem graduated, the coach might have worried about his team without. But though the players were changing, UCLA's winning ways did not. The coach was building a sports dynasty of unparalleled proportion. But not once did he lose sight of the fact that the game was still just a game. He made basketball fun. I mean, he made basketball fun, he made life fun. It was never a drag. I and mean, it was always just, let's, you know, let's go have fun playing basketball. As the Bruins won a record 88 straight games, it was easy to let the good times roll. But when the Bruins didn't get the roll, the coach never let his players stray from their quest for perfection. Whether a player was in trouble on the court or off, the coach was always there. Coach wouldn't always bail me out. He bailed me out every day. But I made so many mistakes in my life. He was just always there. He was always there, supportive. And, uh, you know, much like a uh, supportive father would be, even though he didn't agree with you, you know, he stood up for his players. My players uh, and Nellie, my dear wife, would uh, the players become like her children. And to me, they were off the floor. I'm interested in them as individuals, as human beings. And their problems are my problems, and their joys are my joys. And that continues after they've left your supervision. And even though the final whistle has long since blown, the players to this day turn in times of need to the man they'll always call coach. I remember talking to him after I'd had some very disappointing experiences. And I remember him making the statement, you can't ever stop hoping. You can't ever stop trusting people. You see many players coming back to him and uh, talking to him uh, and calling him and writing him and wanting to stay in touch. Why? Because they want to be in touch with 
the great legend John wouldn't know because they know where love is. Everybody is attracted to love. Everyone's attracted to someone who really cares. And that's what he did. He just cared. Everything else, all the victories came as a result of that. You must be quick, but don't you hurry. We can still hear it ringing in our ears. You were content to make us shine. That's your way. You always walked a step behind. So we were the ones with all the glory. While you were the one with all the strength Teaching us how to play and live for so long Showing us how to love and give Did you ever know that you're my And everything I would like to be I can fly higher than a eagle You are the wind beneath my wings Did I ever tell you you're my hero? I wish I could be And I can fly higher than a eagle You are the wind beneath my wings You are the wind beneath my wings I thank God for John Wooden, uh, the man John Wooden, uh, the spirit of John Wooden, the spirit of John Wooden will live and live and live and live. Thank you, thank you, thank God for you, the wind beneath my Pretty lucky fella, aren't I? <laughs>